Oh uh, yeah. I think so. All right, everybody, we are back on track. I'm very much looking forward to the next talk. You saw I had a bit of trouble reading it, so uh, reading the title, I was thinking, I have no vision, I should certainly go see a doctor. I hope <laughs> these two gentlemen will be my doctors. Uh, yeah, let's get started. Thank you uh, step, for stepping up. Uh, the visual design group has been doing amazing work, so let's give a hand to our presenter. <laughs> and Okay, can you hear me? Thank you. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about visions because we didn't talk about it enough before. So <laughs> let's spend a little more time on it. Um, so um, we want to talk a little bit about this um, because um, obviously, as you heard Thomas mention earlier, um, it's one of the things that drive um, us in the visual design group. I've been learning a lot more about it over the last year, year and a half. Um, there was a time when I started, when I just started in the visual design group where I just wanted to put together pretty pictures. And Thomas and Heiko and a few people have been encouraging me to not just put together pretty pictures, but um, have a purpose when you put those pretty pictures together. So I thought we'd talk about that today. All right, so um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of ways to look at vision. Probably seen lots of visions all over the place. A lot of them kind of look like these. Um, very interesting. I mean, they, they, they can motivate people, it can be really, really, really interesting to have an exciting sounding vision, but in a lot of cases they're not very useful. And this is an example of several of them. Um, and I, they kind of just distill in general what doesn't work so well when you put together a vision. Um, I'll give you some examples. Oh, just so you know, that's kind of what. <laughs> you have anything to say about that? Okay. Just chime in. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, um, some examples from the real world. Um, I like Dell computers, so it's not anything about Dell. But it doesn't get any more vague than that. It, it really doesn't. I mean, it tells you nothing about what it is that they're trying to do. Yeah, everybody wants to be good. Everyone knows that. I don't think anyone goes out there and sets out to be the least successful computer company. So, um, this is another... <laughs> I don't even know who they are, but I googled really bad visions and got that. And you can probably find a host of others. So um, let's talk about a little bit about what makes a bad vision, or a vision, not a big V vision. Um, so vague, that's kind of what we're talking about with a Dell vision. Um, lots of buzzwords, synergy. Yeah, it, go through the, they actually have a mission statement generator online that just basically randomly puts together a bunch of buzzwords with verbs and elaborate mission statements. And then you can go look at some of the company, lots of companies' missions, big corporate missions, and they look pretty similar to what the mission statement generator produces. Um, so buzzwords, um, it's vague. Two page length visions. If you can't communicate your vision in about five minutes, it doesn't work very well. Um, it's, it, it, if it takes that long to digest whatever it is that you're trying to communicate, um, it, it's not doing the job that a, a vision should do. A vision should be able to say to someone, whether it's somebody on the team or outside of the team, what it is that you're trying to do, what it is that you're bringing that's unique, and why, why anyone either in the team should participate or contribute, or why somebody outside the team should um, use your product or use your whatever it is that you're providing, whether it's a service or product. Um, any thoughts on that? Um, confuses the what's in the hows. This is going to fall off before long here, so let me try again. There we go. Um, confusing the what's in the hows. Um, um, I'm an engineer by day, I'm a systems engineer, system safety engineer by day. And one of the things that um, comes up quite a bit in, in my line of work is engineers always forgetting what the difference is between what you're trying to do and how you do it. Um, and, and, and systems engineering, we have this thing where if you have a requirement, a high level requirement, it should tell you what to do. It shouldn't tell you how to do it. Um, figure out what you want to do first. And then once everybody's agreed on what you want to do, go figure out how to do it. 
Um, so confusing what's and how's, can be, you can look at some mission statement able describe their quality system and you know the, the issue tracking system and we have all, but they don't talk about why we have those things. And really a vision should be describing um, the what. Um, why is kind of sit just above the what if you look in your general hierarchy of how requirements should flow down. And uh, again, vague. There's a million words for vague, generic, picket, but it's all, if it's vague, if you sense vagueness, you might want to think about it a little bit. Thoughts, Thomas? Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> okay, so good vision. Um, the, the two are the ones that most people focus on. I mean, we, it needs to have focus, it needs to give you direction. Um, inspiration is the one that people often interpret as vague. If you look at good vision statements, there'll still be the warm fuzzies in there. Um, so when, it, when you, from the previous slide where I mentioned vague, it's not a good thing to have in a, in a vision. Um, you also don't want a vision so spartan, so devoid of meaning and, and passion that nobody cares what it is that you're doing. Um, inspiration matters. Um, so yeah, you, you can still have some of the warm fuzzies in your vision. But it does matter to include, you know, get, add the warm fuzzies after you've defined the specifics of the focus and direction. And add pink glasses to all your visions. They make yeah, and um, for inspiration, your vision can and should be bold. It should be achievable, so nothing that is just completely out of your reach. But if you just mention a vision that you can <laughs> achieve too easily, then it won't exactly give inspiration because people will just do what they're already doing anyway and so it won't help. So in your vision you should set a goal that is above what you already have but of course still achievable. That's a good point. Alright, so this is just an example. There are a million ways to come up with visions. Um, do not take this as canonical. This happens to be one of the things that we it's in the HIG when you're trying to come up with a concept for your project and so come up with a vision for your project. Um, it's just an, an aid to walk through how, what the, the elements that are probably useful in coming up with a vision. And this applies more specifically to an application or a product. Um, but you might substitute a few things in and out if you're talking about organizations or communities. Um, I won't get into the specifics of that. Um, so, but I will give you an example of a really, really good vision. That is an awesome vision. I couldn't, I, I saw this on the, on the, on the internet this morning, and I couldn't pass it up, so I added it this morning. Sorry, Thomas. <laughs> anyway, a really good example of a vision. Everybody's mentioned it before. Um, so in doing a little bit of research for the, the tiny little bit of research I did for this presentation, no, I did vast research for this presentation. Um, it doesn't matter where I go, I keep coming back to this, Krita. I, it, it is rare to find a vision statement that is as clear, as precise, as inspirational as this is. Um, and I'm not talking about within free software, I'm talking about anywhere. And it's not just the words. I, I remember when the Krita team came up with this and they announced it. And I was one of the, what? I want a GIMP for KDE. What are you doing? <laughs> but what was really cool is I, I, it blew me away every single time that I saw the next step that they announced on, on Plant KDE and you, you kept seeing them just rolling, progressing each time. And um, there's, there's a, in, I live in Seattle and there's, there's one artist there. Uh, he, he occasionally shows up at some of our local conferences and he has KDE, he has Krita out. And I saw, I met him last November it was, I think, Valerie. And, um, I saw him doing his stuff. He's an artist, that's what he does. He, he, he is not a developer. And to see him use this tool and produce what he produces, I, it was, I mean, it became crystal clear. This vision wasn't just a bunch of words. It drove a product that is unparalleled by every definition. I mean, you talk to these guys and they love it to death. It's amazing what a vision can do when you use it well and, and let it drive the project. Yeah. Plus. As you can see here, that vision doesn't exclude anything specifically. It doesn't say, we do not do this and we do not want to have that. So, theoretically, if someone wanted to do something that is not 
particularly useful for digital painting, they could still do it. And it probably wouldn't be rejected, but this is what the team focuses on, and this is what they want to do right and do best. And so, yeah, as, as some people feel that, oh, it might exclude some ideas, it doesn't have to. It still provides focus and it still produces a great product. So, um, so that was an example, but here's some of the things that um, we, we see um, that visions can do. Um, before I go too deeply into this, it, it's really important um, from the previous slides that if you have a project that you're working on, it's not about just coming up with a vision for a product. Um, what re was really important in, in the example, that little example too, it, what do you guys, what do you think about yourselves? What is it that you're trying to create a vision for? It's not, uh, so it, you kind of, you go through this navel gazing exercise of defining yourself to try to understand what it is that you're actually doing. It, it matters in that, and, and from the previous conversation, I don't want to editorialize too much, but if it's about community, then define what that is. Just, it, it matters to have that navel gazing exercise and to define what it is that you're trying to do, um, to define your vision. Okay, I'll get back to the slide. Sorry for the editorial. Um, okay. Um, vision enables you to do stuff. If you create a vision that's not enabling you to do stuff, stop. It's, it's going to be pretty words. So create a vision with a view to enabling you to do specific things. Uh, visual design group kind of focus on user interface design, so we're going to talk a little bit about those. Um, identify applicable personas. We'll talk about what personas are. Target scenarios that, um, that you want to develop to connect your user to the, to the goals that they're trying to accomplish. Um, their user stories. Um, make better UI design decisions. We all want to make better UI design decisions. One of the great things about having a vision and all the things that flow down from that is it helps you actually have a sensible conversation about how to design your user interface. And it, it, for clarity, there's a lot of people that have really good user interface design skills. It does not mean that you aren't doing this kind of intuitive connection to the vision in the background. Um, so a lot of people that are really good at user interface design, they can whip out something, but a lot of times what's actually happening in the back, the back of their brains is this connection. Well, what is it that they're trying to do with this project? Um, how can we connect what they're trying to do to the, the user interface design? Um, other general things that actually is really, really helpful, project management. What's in scope and out of scope? This is, yes, this sometimes is, okay, well, somebody wants us to develop a sorting algorithm and put it into KDE, let's say Dolphin. Um, maybe we don't need that in Dolphin. Maybe that, that's not, maybe, you know, there's some things that just don't belong and having that focus actually helps to say this doesn't belong. In this specific, I mean, we, I, we, we've done media players, there's tons of them. Um, do I necessarily want my media player to do slideshows? Sometimes you do, because that's what we want our product to do. Maybe we don't, so it just depends on what you're trying to do. And then prioritization, this is what Thomas talked about. Um, it's, sometimes it's not about saying no, sometimes it's about, okay, we have limited resources, where do we apply them? I'll let you talk about this one. Because <laughs> I think this is great, but he came up with the slides. So. Yeah, um, a tagline. There, there's one tagline which has become sort of famous by now within our community, which is uh, the, the VDG's tagline, um, simple by default, powerful when needed. Um, so this is, this is just, it isn't a vision because um, it, yeah, it doesn't contain the, the necessary parts and it, well, it isn't vague because you can, everybody understands what it means and um, apparently it's catchy enough that people remember it pretty quickly. But um, I wouldn't say it necessarily replaces a vision because um, it's just too short for that, but it, it complements a vision quite well. Um, because, yeah, on the one hand, you can of course use it for uh, internal communication because if you discuss with someone Maybe you don't want to repeat the vision every time, but if you just mention your tagline, and uh, then of, often you can already pretty quickly decide whether your idea is in line with that tagline. And um, yeah, of course, it's also really useful for outside communication and for, for marketing and promo. So not only we know about that tagline, but a lot of people outside as well. And um, people, 
when, when I put out that tagline in a, in a blog post, um, I didn't only get positive reactions. Some, some people reacted negatively to it, but that was also, um, in a way, a good thing because people who don't agree with that tagline um, probably won't agree with, our, with what we do anyway. So they, they can just see, okay, is this something I want to use? then uh, fine, then I can look forward to what the VDG and KDE in general will produce. And if I don't like that, then maybe I should go look elsewhere. Um, yeah, and another example, um, which wasn't officially <coughs> agreed, but somehow came up, is uh, Plasma gets stuff done. So when, when David practiced um, his talk from yesterday um, with me, so I thought, hey, David, you just presented a tagline for Plasma, and you probably weren't even aware of it. And, but still, it's something that probably most of the Plasma team already agrees upon, and it just hasn't been really formulated as this is our tagline yet. But um, yeah, as you can see, this is really something that can easily show people what Plasma is about, and as such, it's awesome. Yeah, um, I don't have a whole lot to add. I mean, it, it's, it's a great communication tool. It's, it's almost like a mental link to your vision. Um, it's a quick way to say, hey, this is in line or out of line with our vision. Um, so yeah, taglines are, are great. I like them. So um, I'm not going to say a whole lot on this because this is Thomas's domain, but um, what, one, I'm sorry, I'm going to throw you on the floor. Uh, no, um, one of the things that... Um, I, I, I've found, I've learned over the last um, year and a half that visions allow you to do is it really provides the boundaries, the scope for developing these kind of essential things um, that, that's helpful for user interface design. Um, I'll go ahead, Thomas. I'll talk about it. <laughs> yeah, well, many of you probably have already heard of the concept. Some of you maybe have not. So, um, yeah, Persona is a fictional character created to represent the different user types that might use a product in a similar way. So um, ideally, and in the, in the original concept, personas were meant to be uh, based on actual user research and user data, and this is still the, the best way to do them, because um, yeah, if, if you don't have data, then it's still sort of guesswork, but um, in most cases, even guesswork-based personas are still better than having nothing at all because um, even if the, um, the perception of the team that the team has about their users doesn't exactly match the, the actual users, then even then you still have, can make sure that everyone is talking about the same thing. Because if you don't express what you think or how you think your users are, then everybody in the team has their own um, their own representation and their own thoughts about the users. And um, different people will have different uh, focus and sometimes they may even argue about something and each team member thinks he's right or she because they, um, they have their own user group in mind. And once you have made this explicit and said, okay, uh, we agree that we think or know, ideally know, how our users are, then um, yeah, you can, you can have common ground to, this, to base your discussions on. You, you can also use them to target who you're trying to actually build your project for. Um, sometimes you might want to try to build it for everyone. You can't. Pick someone. Or two. Or three. Exactly. So yeah, that's, that's also important. Even if you have several user target user groups and therefore several personas, you should still, or you have to still have a primary persona and say, okay, this has to work really well for this persona. We can add features for the other personas as long as um, they don't hamper the experience of the um, primary persona. Then, um, yeah, scenarios are a description of what a persona using a product um, or yeah, a scenario where a persona uses a product to achieve a certain goal. So this is on a higher level than um, user stories. 
So, for example, I know, one scenario for a media player might, for example, be um, a party. So the, the persona yeah, might be someone who has a lot of friends and wants to impress them with um, their cool technology they're using. And um, yeah, they're, they're at a party and, for example, at the party everyone is allowed to, um, to choose the music. Um, yeah, so that, that isn't yet a user story, but it describes in general what is happening in this situation and it has important implications on the actual user stories. Um, yeah, and then the user story is the, the lower level where, for example, um, um, a persona representing a guest at the party wants um, to change the track to something else uh, from within the, the media library. Um, and yeah, so there are of course several of those user stories within the scenario and uh, the user stories are then the thing which is translated into actual features. So, like we've, like we've mentioned several times before, um, they provide the basics for building great user interfaces and, as we mentioned, they derive from a good vision, not a terrible vision. You can't get anything from a terrible vision. Um, so, um, I'm about to go through some, an example. Um, this is stuff that Thomas and I kind of worked through. I, I don't even think I have all of your comments captured in it. And this is not meant to be, hey, the Plasma team, go do this. That's not what this is meant to be. So Plasma team, it's OK. <laughs> Everything's going to be OK. OK. Um, so um, it, this, is, this has been, I, I, I confess, this is, uh, this is something Thomas has been thinking about for a while, and I've kind of glommed on to it. And um, it was the, the, the desktop configuration for Plasma. And you know, Thomas has had some thoughts about this for a while. You can either slam the Plasma team now. I'm just kidding. You're not going to do that. <laughs> um, but so we were thinking about this. And um, so what we wanted to do was, well, what if we went through this exercise? Um, and, we, and this was like last year. Um, and n no vision here has been approved by the Plasma team. Uh, so <laughs> let's get that out of the way. This was, how can we, what, what will we use to guide for example, the, des the design of our desktop configuration, if we were to propose a new design. And w we can talk offline about this plasma team, whether or not this is something that makes sense, settle down. <laughs> okay, um, so we came, up, we came up with this vision, um, or I came up with this vision and Thomas didn't object strenuously to it. Um, <laughs> so um, plasma de desktop provides an easy to use workspace effortless that you can read <laughs> for you. Um, so this is, this is what we use to, to kind of to guide the, the next few steps in um, the, the, the design. Um, we, K, KDE has um, some prepackaged personas that you can use um, if you're doing your own work. So um, you can go, I, I think they're linked in the HIG. Yeah, in fact, I know they're linked in the HIG. So if you, if you go to the HIG um, and you're trying to find personas for your project, um, there's some prepackaged ones. And what I found is that in most instances, they cover most of um, the, the needs that you need for uh, user interface design. So um, you'll see these names here. They're actual names from the, the personas. They were created back in KDE4, by the way. Oh, my God, I said that. <laughs> but wh what are we calling it these days? Is it, OK, whatever. <laughs> so Su <laughs> Susan, Philip, and Santiago, their personas um, for uh, from the, the from the standard prepackaged personas, and when you read their stories, you re when you read who they are, it'll make sense why we use them. Um, so we came up with several scenarios. I think there are probably about seven, eight, nine, ten scenarios. I forget how many there are. Um, this is an example of one of them. It's uh, it's really wordy, um, but the point is to hey, sit down and think about what it is that your people are going to be using your thing, your widget, your product, whatever it is, and come up with these scenarios. And it kind of helps with the design. Um, as it turns out, the next few slides will not be about this scenario, but I just want to show you what a scenario looks like. OK, so screenshots are coming up. Oh, no, no, mock-ups are coming up. These are not screenshots. These are mock-ups. Um, yeah, don't freak out. OK, so the, the, the mock-ups are really about, um, well, what if we kind of tried to refine our panel configuration? Oh, by the way, this has been out on the community.kd.org wiki for like the last ever. I mean, like a, it's been out there for months. Um, so this isn't new stuff. It, it's been out there for a while. Um, so you can't see anything on this wonderful <laughs> high-resolution screen. 
Um, but the idea, I'm going to walk through what this design essentially does for just the panel configuration. Um, okay, so pretend that you click a button here and that's the, the selection or menu. Um, and you select the, hey, I want to edit my panel. Um, good lord, this is terrible. <laughs> so that's kind of a dialogue-y thing. You can read the thing below it, that you can guess what, what it's saying. Um, so th there's a little black bar above it, there's some grab handles on there. Um, the hovers, hover over the mouse over over the, um, the panel applets are pretty much the same. But you get a little bit, something a little bit easier to maybe look at and read and understand in terms of what the panel configuration options are. It would follow the mouse, so if you hover over the top panel, if you have multiple panels, then that, that dialog would follow um, the panel that you're hovering on. Um, this doesn't show it very well. But, so the handles for the, the min-max size for the panels, this is what this is supposed to show with the anchor. It's just a different visualization for allowing you to, to change the panel width. This is what it looks like when you have your min panel set and max panel set. Um, there's a lot more on the community that KDE Wiki. The point is um, you can use Using those scenarios kind of helps you narrow down, especially for the edit panel, the, the edit panel dialogue. Um, what do you think they want to use in there? You kind of refer to your scenario or your user stories to kind of figure out, well, what are they doing in this state? What, they, what don't they want to be doing in this state? Um, what are things that you can recede into the background or remove from availability um, when they're in this state of configuration? That's really kind of one of the things that we're focusing on is try to pull stuff away from the user. And do you have anything else on this? Do you have anything else to talk? Okay. So, finally, in summary, <laughs> visions drive projects, they drive organizations, they drive communities, and it really makes it easy to do user interface design consistently. That's it. We have like time for half a question, a question that Mike and I can, if there are any questions at this point in time, otherwise grab the two in your arms. Oh, 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 yeah, that. That, that, I think that, I forget that. So, yeah, we have boffs. So, go, go to them, ask us questions at the boffs. Okay. I have one question. Um, you, you gave a great example for a good product vision, uh, with the Krita vision. Uh, do you also have a good example for a uh, higher level vision for a community, so more an organizational vision, corporate community sure. vision? Is there I, uh, something really good we could use as an uh, inspiration? I certainly go do the research. No. <laughs> uh, I, for, for the places that I've seen it um, work well, and I don't have the words off the top of my head, um, but it's, it's, it's a little bit what I alluded to in the navel gazing piece um, and knowing what you are. Um, sometimes organizations define themselves on the product. Um, I, so I just started a new job at Blue Origin. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Blue Origin. Um, they, um, they build rockets, which is fun. But um, it, one of the, there's a welcome letter. And in that welcome letter, they talk about what the company's vision is. And one of the things that they mentioned in there, this is an example, is um, we, we, don't just, we don't just build a space vehicle. We're building a company that builds space vehicles. That focuses a lot of what happens in that organization because it's not just about focusing on the one product. It's about organization focusing on what you want to do in the, when you're making those decisions day to day. So for me, if you're talking about community, is the community really about the product or is the community about supporting a community that builds products, for example? I think there are a lot of ways for you to look at that design, that vision, um, I, I think it's just doing a little bit of navel gazing to try to figure out what it is that we're doing. Yeah, or for example, the, the Mozilla, um, I don't know if they call it mission or vision or whatever, um, it's, also, it's not perfect, but it's also a, a nice example to draw from. All right. Thank you again, Thomas and Andrew. We are really out of time.